Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, today's webinar, The Shocking Truth About Vitamin D Status. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, um, Dr. Greg Gregory Plotnikoff. Dr. Plotnikoff is a board-certified internist and pediatrician who has received international honors for his work in cross-cultural and integrative medicine. Greg is a graduate of Carleton College, Harvard Divinity School, and University of Minnesota Medical School. From 2002 to 2008, Dr. Platnikoff served as an associate professor at Keio University of Medicine, where he studied, researched, and taught the Campbell Herbal Medicine tradition. In Japan, he was active in East-West medical integration issues with the Japanese Society of Oriental Medicine, National Geographic, and the World Health Organization. He is the recipient of several international awards for research and teaching as well as the Early Career Distinguished Achievement Award from the University of Minnesota Medical School. Dr. Plotnikoff is well known for his work in interventional nutrition, herbal medicines, and spirituality and clinical care. He has additional training as a hospital chaplain in medical acupuncture and mind-body skills as a practitioner of traditional East Asian medicine. He is a co-author of the book, Trust Your Gut, and author of 22 textbook chapters and more than 50 first author articles in medical literature, including several in Japanese. His 2003 article on vitamin D and chronic pain is one of the most highly cited articles in the history of Mayo Clinic proceedings. Dr. Plotnikoff serves as an integrative medicine physician at Penny George Institute for Health and Healing and is Senior Consultant, Center of Healthcare Innovation, Alina Healthcare, Minneapolis, Minnesota. He also serves as a co-editor of the new journal, Global Advances in Health and Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Greg Plotnikoff. Okay, well, thank you very much and welcome everyone. We're glad you're here. I just want to um, silence the speakers here. We need our IT team to actually silence the speaker because it seems to be okay. But I want thank you for joining me about the shocking truth about vitamin D status. We want to make this fun. We make it, want to make it practical. We want you to enjoy what is going on and uh, be able to leave today um, knowing some things would be important for your own life and life of the people you work with and uh, you care about. And so um, let's go to the uh, first slide here. I just want to acknowledge that I'm not making off-label use and I do have a financial relationship to disclose. I do have I'm getting an honorarium for providing this presentation. I want to thank Diasorin because actually I feel very passionate about being able to show, share this data with you today that will make a difference. Um, so thank you um, very much. And uh, we will start with where we are today, kind of this focus in our lives around our culture, around healthy body, healthy mind, healthy spirit. And let's go back to this, healthy body. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Um, let's see, I hear we're getting feedback. I'm going to ask... Uh, um, we just take a second out here, and I don't have, um, excuse me, everyone. Is this okay now, Don? Is this okay now, Don? Is this okay now, Don? Okay? Oops, that is not okay. So let me just say, <laughs> Just as we're kind of working with the issues around feedback, and I apologize to everyone, healthy body is kind of like, wait a second, what's this guy doing? Doesn't he know that every photon touching our skin is a potential carcinogen? And so, in fact, actually, we live in a culture now where actually what used to be the case um, may no longer be the case. We may actually be suffering from a form of nature deficit disorder. And that is we have kind of creating 24-7, 365 feedback um, in terms of we are living in the same uh, environment every day. And lo and behold, in front of our computers. Is it having any consequence? Yes. In fact, what do we need to be aware of? Should we actually be not covering up? In fact, uh, and we say, well, we won't address that directly, but we will say safe sunning, 
no burning as being very important. But many cultures of the world where actually sun has not been um, a big part, for example, Siberia, have actually developed ways of accommodating this. And this is a nice picture from Life magazine from many years ago. Um, and um, and we'll just have to go um, and say that, in fact, cultures can be very aware of this. I'm getting a report that there's still feedback. Um, please let me ex excuse myself for a second. Um, turn off speakers or other source. I'm sorry, um, Don, I cannot uh, turn off speakers here. So, and we'll just try moving uh, things. So let me go on to the next slide. Just as, uh, let me ask about when you think a headline like this would appear. Ricketts making a comeback in the UK. Is this something from the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century? That childhood disease that caused bowed legs and curved spines making a shocking comeback? When would this be? Reported November 8th, 2013. In fact, pictures like this are being increasingly seen worldwide, maybe part of your own clinical practice. In fact, we actually have kind of ignored the fact that we may not be all that progressed uh, beyond Victorian era if, in fact, Ricketts is being so uh, commonly seen. But we go back to 2010, New York Times, talking about vitamin D, what happened? It promised to be most talked about and read about supplement of the decade. Huh. Why? A huge part of the population, from robust newborns to the frail elderly, and many others in between, are deficient in this essential nutrient. 2010, New York Times. 2010, Institute of Medicine report on calcium and vitamin D. What's going on? Well, they lowered the definition of what constitutes a normal vitamin D level by a third to 20 nanograms per ml. They asserted that Americans, North Americans, with a few exceptions, have sufficient vitamin D. And third, they tripled the recommended vitamin D intake for people aged 50 or less to 600 international units per day. Radical changes. And so, um, what can we say about this? Well, we can say that um, that things is, remain controversial. Just last month in The Lancet, a meta-analysis on bone mineral density suggested that, hmm, we should not be giving vitamin D to people. It seems inappropriate is what was reported in The Lancet. And yet, last week, this article out of um, a UK newspaper, Rise and Rickett sparks debate on vitamins for all under fives. In fact, actually in the UK, they're debating, insisting that all children get extra vitamin D. Kind of contrasting messages here. So let's look at the most authoritative stated statement out of the Institute of Medicine. And that is, yes, calcium and vitamin D does play key roles in bone health, and yes, they assert that current evidence does not support other benefits for vitamin D. Well, this is pretty controversial. What do you mean current evidence does not support other benefits? Well, it comes down to this evidence uh, idea about what is evidence. And we're going to limit evidence to randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses. But to make con sense of this, we need to cover a little bit about the biology and pathophysiology of vitamin D issues. So, let me just uh, um, do a uh, kind of review of what is happening. We know that sun touching the skin, if it's of a certain strength, will actually kind of begin the activation process of creating uh, pre-vitamin D that uh, then goes to the liver and gets further, act, uh, further steps in, towards activation. And then many of us have been taught it goes to the kidney where it's finally activated and then to the rest of the body. And this is still true, but the nuance is, in fact, actually, that once it leaves the liver, actually goes to many parts of the body. In fact, there are vitamin D receptors throughout the body where vitamin D will be activated 
and so it can serve as both an autocrine and a paracrine function, that is local activation, local um, activity. In fact, it does not require the kidney solely uh, to be activated. Additional nuances from the latest science is that there are vitamin D receptors throughout the body, that there are P450 CYP enzymes, which are active in both um, activating vitamin D as well as breaking down vitamin D. There are polymorphisms in these, and there's great variability by family, by ethnicity, etc. And then we have this whole issue of a vitamin D binding protein. Um, and so this is where the cutting edge of research is at this time. But what do we know for sure? We know that vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a hormone. It is a potent secosteroid, a broken steroid, that binds the superfamily of nuclear receptors for steroid hormones, including estrogen, testosterone, and thyroid, and they all share and they all interact. We do know that there are vitamin D receptors in every tissue of the body, including every brain cell, every immune cell, every muscle cell. And we know that vitamin D is a regulator of at least a thousand key genes in the body. We also know that actually there's actually non-genomic responses, non-hormonal activity for vitamin D, a variety of things. Don't need to know these in specific, just to know that, hmm, there's a lot of biological plausibility behind activity for vitamin D. Not controversial is, is the fact that actually vitamin D regulates proliferation, differentiation, apoptosis, so it may be relevant to cancer. Not controversial is that activated vitamin D plays many roles in key issues related to cancer. But what is controversial is this idea of evidence that doesn't support other benefits. And this is why it's been so important that we actually move forward with prospective randomized controlled trials um, because that is the only con that's the only thing that really constitutes evidence. We're throwing out public health epidemiology, we're throwing out a, a, uh, association studies, biological plausibility, they all are important, but do not constitute evidence according to the Institute of Medicine. So, but let's take a look. I want you to be aware of five controversies. Controversy number one, what is normal? And relate to that, who is normal? And you will recognize that these are profoundly political questions. So let's take a look at how this applies. Back in the 70s when, quote, normal standards were being um, addressed and measurements were first being done, people took a look at two populations, office workers and lifeguards, and took a number of hours in the sun and water vitamin D levels, and lo and behold, those people who were out in the sun had about two and a half times greater uh, vitamin D uh, status than those people who, quote, normal. Now, which population would you take as your reference population? Well, people said, hey, I'm an office worker, I'm normal, therefore that's our reference population, rather than looking at outdoor workers like lifeguards and farmers. But that introduces a kind of a very interesting issue now, because if we take a look at key issues like we're Puerto Rican farmers, or um, like here, or St. Louis lifeguards, or Israeli lifeguards, Look, they're all running around between 60 and 65 for measured levels. The Institute of Medicine um, actually was looking at levels of 20, and um, other authoritative bodies, such as the Endocrine Society, have suggested levels of 30. Hmm, very different. So who is normal? What is normal? Remains a very interesting political question. It's a value judgment. Controversy number two, and that is this issue of um, what is sufficiency in terms of what is your reference, your index disease. So we know index diseases um, are all things that uh, traditionally have been very short latencies. For example, thiamine and beriberi, niacin and pellagra, you know, vitamin C and scurvy, and for vitamin D, Rickets. Rickets has been the index disease. That's very interesting. What happens with this? What about long latency diseases? These are all short latency, very easy to understand historically. 
But what about long-term consequences of suboptimal levels? What about different metabolic mechanisms besides calcium homeostasis, for example, and uh, vitamin D? And for our clinical observations, are we attributing things to actually non-nutritional causes rather than uh, nutritional status itself? Now, the Institute of Medicine took this on and they said, let's take a look at everything. And that's when they came back and said, you know, we only have randomized controlled trials on bone health. That is going to be what our uh, index uh, will uh, refer to. But let's look at this third controversy, again, around what is a normal level. Where did the general recommendation for 400 international units come from? It came from one article published in 1940 in JAMA. Actually, not even a real article, it was a review article. In it, two paragraphs addressed the issue of around vitamin D intake. And these were paragraphs related to white kids in Boston who did not have rickets. They said, why don't these kids have rickets? Everyone has rickets. And the point was that, oh, they're taking cod liver oil. Oh. How much vitamin D in cod liver oil? 400 international units, a tablespoon. Is it a tablespoon what they're getting? Yeah, okay. That is the recommendation. And that, for decades, was the limit of the science. That couple paragraphs, 1940 review article on rickets. It was repeated in a 1963 pediatrics article and just taken as a gospel truth ever since. So it was important that when the IOM take a, took a look at updating uh, this recommendation, um, and so they went from 400 to 600 international units uh, recommendation for most people, or those above 70, possibly 800, they said. Controversy number four you need to know about is this idea that, oh, you just need 15 minutes of sun. But wait a second. It's kind of like there are latitude issues in fact, the further north you go, the closer you get to the North Pole, the less sun you're going to get. So I can tell you that here, I'm in about 45 degrees north in Minnesota, about halfway to the North Pole. We can really only make vitamin D, and I tell people, between tax day, April 15th, and Labor Day, September 1st, roughly speaking. But even that has nuances, because if we take a look at this index, of ultraviolet uh, rays reaching the ground here in Minneapolis, um, we can see the black line here, which follows a nice bell curve, um, is what would be predicted for high noon on a cloudless day. The blue lines here are actually actual measurements. So look at this. June, July, August, you can be out having a great picnic and still not get much exposure to ultraviolet B necessary for making vitamin D. And in fact, if you've ever flown into a town or city, you see a kind of brown haze over the horizon, consider that a vitamin D umbrella. It may look like you're, it's sunny on the ground, but in fact, rays reaching the ground may be quite different. And in fact, there's been reports that rays reaching the ground in a sunny city like Hong Kong a subtropical city closer to, much closer to the equator, uh, in fact, have gone down by at least 20% over recent years because smog coming in from Guangzhou in, West, in eastern China. So, uh, in fact, even a nice sunny day may not be enough. Fifth controversy, and we want to spend significant time on this, and that is that the I Institute of Medicine emphasized that with a few exceptions, all North Americans are receiving enough vitamin D. Now, okay, the question is, with a few exceptions, who are these exceptions? Well, one exception is going to be immigrants and refugees. So recently I and some colleagues published on nearly 1,400 immigrants and refugees passing through our international clinic um, here in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And we took a look at vitamin D status upon their arrival into the United States. Out of these nearly 1,400, more than 800 
were deficient. And deficient was following the Institute of Medicine guideline of 20 nanograms per ml. Of these, 200, more than 200, were severely deficient. There's a vitamin D level of less than 10 nanograms per ml. And in fact, origin uh, uh, made a big difference. 126 out of 155 Ethiopians from East Africa, um, so dark skin, um, versus uh, about one third of those from Russia, light skin. Shocking was the fact that the deficiency which was much worse in young people compared with old people, or excuse me, I should say those older than 66. Um, shocking. So many people can have low levels and it's young people. So, okay. You say, well, that's just a small portion of our population. True. So let's take a look at data from the National Health and Nutrition Assessment uh, um, survey here. So let me just uh, get this next slide. Here we go. Okay. This is data um, from the um, early 90s, and that's the black line and the around 2000 2004 that's the gray line this was published in the archives of internal medicine in 2009 it was not cited by the institute of medicine as being a good study but they reported that there is a change in technology halfway through so making these comparisons are a little bit nuanced however what i want to point out is that as we look at ethnicities even with the same technologies there's a big discrepancy between white and black, um, Mexican American, and others. Significant discrepancies. And so whether you look at um, um, time from uh, comparison over 10 years of things going down, or you take a look at um, approximately the same time, there are significant discrepancies. So the question is, how many of the health disparities in our country are due to um, actually vitamin D status rather than say uh, other social issues, uh, institutionalized racism and the like. It may just be that we have blinders uh, to um, importance of vitamin D status. But we take a look at particularly at severely um, or profoundly vitamin D deficient people, look at um, uh, under African Americans, nearly 30% recently were found to be severely or profoundly vitamin D deficient. Very different than uh, using same technologies for other populations. Hmm. Skin color does make a difference for whatever reason. And if we look at actually um, meeting the Endocrine Society's recommendations of 30 nanograms per ml, in fact, just a very small percentage of our African-American population, very small percentage of Mexican-Americans, very small percent of other um, ethnicities met that. And in fact, only about 30% of the white population met that. And so therefore, when we talk about a few exceptions, we can say, yes, our immigrants and refugees, particularly those um, uh, with dark skin, as well as our native population, people with dark skin, but even among um, Caucasians, is still a very few, a very small percentage actually meets uh, endocrine society recommendations of 30 nanograms per ml. So we decided to take a look at this issue here in Minnesota. Looking at, um, we were able to study 10,646 Alina employees in the year 2010. Now this is very interesting because the vast majority were white. These are highly ed educated health professionals, mostly nurses, doctors, pharmacists, uh, CMAs, and the like. Um, people who know something about health, working health system. 100% had insurance. Healthcare insurance was not a barrier. And in the two years prior to the study, there were at least 15 articles in the local newspaper on vitamin D deficiency, including a very large Sunday um, front page article 
um, with the company other articles plus a interactive um, a webinar plus video um, massive um, outreach around vitamin D and um, these uniquely in this country these were all tested within a very narrow time period and that is um, between February and April of 2010. What can I say about um, this? Well, we took a look at by IOM standards and by endocrine society standards of what is sufficient. And I can tell you, here's the data. So, out of 10,646, 6% 6 had levels less than 10 among all the, among the health professionals. An additional 25% um, had levels less than the Institute of Medicine requirements. So in fact, a total of 30% did not meet Institute of Medicine requirements. And if we took a look at Endocrine Society guidelines, it comes down to 60% of employees, um, excuse me, uh, additional 30% did not meet it. So altogether, 60% were less than Endocrine Society standards. Now you can say, wait a second, how could this be? Health professionals should be knowing about this. And well, maybe we health professionals saying, well, we know this intellectually, therefore it doesn't really matter, you know, like diet and exercise. If we know it, then it doesn't really count. But in fact, actually, this does count. And we published in the Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine um, a correlation between vitamin D status and actual presenteeism issues. And we documented if people had a level greater than 40, it would have saved our health care uh, presenteeism expenses for the company of 23,000 employees. It would have saved um, over $2.5 million. Okay, so what can we say about self-reported dosing? We well, can see here that for um, levels, let's say, let's start here with um, 200 to 400 national units. These are the levels um, you know, be found in traditional prenatal vitamin or multivitamin. And in fact, you end up getting very significantly lower levels than people who are uh, over here at three to 4,000 a day. So we can say, yes, how much we take does make a difference. Now, this is a little bit of a complex slide. We wanted to take a look at women of childbearing age. Because these are women that um, are con um, considering pregnancy, um, therefore planning ahead. And as health professionals, we would expect them to be kind of ahead of the curve. But in fact, even among these women of childbearing age, look at this, more than 30% didn't meet the requirements of at least 20 nanograms per ml. Now, the end is pretty big, 5,600 women of childbearing age. And if we take a look at the women who are reported taking prenatal vitamin, right here, and we take a look at the different lines, so at 20 nanograms per ml, we look to the side here, in fact, wow, big percentages. So we looked at BMI, and that's what makes this complicated. So if we look at a BMI of someone with level less than, a BMI less than 30, about 17% did not meet uh, uh, the requirements despite taking a prenatal vitamin or multivitamin. And if the BMI is greater than 30, it's about 25% or below this recommendation. Now the numbers jump significantly if we make the recommendation 30 nanograms per ml. So bottom line is we can say that, wow, health professionals working a system, knowledgeable, highly insured, highly educated, taking a multivitamin or prenatal vitamin, no guarantee that it will be sufficient. Now, I want to also point out that this difference about BMI. So here we have took a look at BMI below and above 30. Um, and so below 30 in the green, above 30 uh, in the blue. And looking at different dosing, Across all these dosing ranges, notice that there's a big difference. If you've got a BMI greater than 30, it is, uh, you're going to have a significantly lower vitamin D status um, for a given dose than for other people. 
Now, given the percent of Americans who have BMI is greater than 30, it's climbing, skyrocketing. Uh, this is an important clinical consideration. And if we take a look at high dose, um, we can say that, say, high dose of three to 4,000 international units a day, even then, we had significant numbers of people who were below the requirements of even the Institute of Medicine report. So my concern is, and what I wanted to share with you, is, wow, Institute of Medicine report seems to be missing some, um, some concerns that we can really only address by actually getting serum measurements. And so let's talk about kind of the take-home points um, from these, uh, this data. I'm going to say that truly, female healthcare workers of childbearing age have a high incidence of vitamin D deficiency, despite even if they're taking a prenatal or multivitamin, and that a BMI greater than 30 is a substantially increased risk of sub uh, sufficient uh, vitamin D levels. And even if someone's taking 4,000 international units a day, no uh, elevated uh, levels of vitamin D. So, where do we go with all this? Well, I now want to talk with you, talk around some uh, concerns about um, next steps and where we uh, as health professionals uh, may be going with this. And so, one concern is that, the, is that the Institute of Medicine said there's no evidence that levels higher than 600 international units a day are going to confer benefits to the population. In fact, they can say that there's other health problems associated with this. So the idea that more is better, which is such an a American concept, if a little bit is good, more is better, you're playing up on that. But let's take a look at some nuances around that. Number one, if we look at bone health issues, as a document by Willett and uh, Bishop Ferrari and other kind of noted uh, uh, authorities and researchers, it's kind of optimal bone density is found in multiple studies at levels much greater than 20 nanograms per ml. And there's some nice re uh, citations here. But even more importantly, there have been over a dozen studies with an N of greater than 40,000 and demonstrate that level of 20 is not enough to either prevent fractures, I'm certainly concerned about that, or falls, but higher levels do. British Medical Journal, Archives of Internal Medicine, we need to at least take this in and say, hmm, this is a nuanced uh, consideration. Second thing we're going to is that higher doses are not toxic. You know, the much fear out there is kind of like, hmm, if I, if I could, I, this is a fat-soluble vitamin, am I going to create toxicity if I take more than 600 international units a day? We can say that no. Actually, the body has self-correcting mechanisms. Toxicity reports in literature of people who have been taking millions of international units on kind of a um, acute or basis. It's not um, a daily uh, um, intake over time. Because in fact, our P450 enzymes can be up and down regulated, and so there are homeostatic protection mechanisms in our body uh, for this. Um, now, where is toxicity actually occur? Um, it's believed to be greater levels greater than 200 nanograms per ml. So getting up to level 40 to 60, even level 100, 110, that can be an issue. We don't recommend it, but it seems like there's some logic that that uh, we should feel comfortable having levels at least around upwards of 60 if that's what outdoor workers uh, would have. We can say that that's probably not going to be harmful because uh, we've had many, um, about 10,000 generations of people out in the sun you know, over time. So let's take a look at other laboratory guides which provide nuance and understanding a normal vitamin D level. If we look at parathyroid hormone and we plot it against vitamin D concentrations, we see that there's a significant inflection point at around 20, and that PTH plateaus is minimized at a level of around 40. If we look at calcium absorption, we know that's optimized at levels greater than 32. 
So if we take an IOM level of 20 and raise that in a person to 30, and the Endocrine Society recommendation, calcium absorption increases by as much as 65%. Of course, then that is going to change in our calcium recommendations so of 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day. And that's why the World Health Organization has said for vitamin D replete women, 500 milligrams a day is, um, is recommended. Now, if people are taking in extra calcium, where is that going? Is it going to the bones? We can say no. At best, extra calcium has been shown to be just slightly better than placebo at increasing bone mineral density. Um, it certainly slows the rate of loss, but in fact, um, we do have to worry about calcium deposition elsewhere in the body. So in fact, we might not want big intakes of calcium. And as reported in JAMA just a couple months ago, in fact, big intakes of calcium in men appears to be associated with increased uh, mortality. Uh, so um, again, caution around where um, this is. Now, we also have to recognize that, that there's a significant issue around um, what constitutes the role of a public health approach versus the role of a clinical approach. The Institute of Medicine was acting under a public health uh, recommendation. So this is where a denominator dispute came to be. So let me explain. Much of the strength of the Institute of Medicine's recommendations came from one study of 675 cadavers in Germany. And these were uh, people mostly in accidents. Uh, in fact, they're almost entirely accidents, so they didn't have a kind of acute illness. They took a look at vitamin D status at the time of death and bone mineral density status at the time of death and plotted the two against each other. Now, what is listed here as a denominator dispute is that the Institute of Medicine was making recommendations for the entire population. And so a lot of people have said, well, wait a second, what about these people here who fall in the category of, quote, weak bones, and yet were above the 20 nanograms per ml recommendation by the IOM? Why did the IOM choose this level as opposed to say over here. And the point is, is that they weren't trying to get everyone taken care of, and therefore these seven people here were under a denominator of 675 rather than seven out of 30. And, this, and so that's, you can see, wow, this is an important nuance. It is a value judgment as to what you consider your denominator. Is it the whole 675 or is it 7 out of the 30? Now, from a clinical perspective, most people would say, hey, I care about these seven people. Why not just move the vitamin D requirements up to 30? And you can say, well, this is where public health and clinicians clash. Um, and so, um, you might also say, but wait a second, the vitamin D level can change throughout a year. Bone mineral density doesn't go up and down much. Is this a stock and flow issue? In fact, was this really the right study to base everything on for the Institute of Medicine report? And again, I leave that to you um, to consider. It appears to be a value judgment as to whether this is actually the best guide. And clearly, there's a value judgment as to what you consider your denominator, 675, um, and therefore 7 out of 675, not a big issue, or is it 30 um, and 7 out of 30 making it a difference? It's clear that the IOM said, okay, for population, we want this line right here, 20 nanograms per ml. Um, the author of this paper just presumed it would be 30 nanograms per ml because, the, because of these seven people over here. So how does the IOM explain this? They say, look, we have a public health focus, not a clinical focus. We are not making clinical recommendations. We're addressing free living, 
non-monitored people out in the population. So, the dietary recommendations, uh, dietary recommended intake, um, and relevant probability distributions of risk is the focus. These are calculations, um, not based on particular clinical measurements. So what are the median requirements and the risk? And focus on distribution of dose response effects. So this is an important nuance. The goal for report groups like the IOM is to determine the level which 50% of the population's needs are met in the estimated uh, requirements and the level which 97.5% of the population are going to have their needs met. And that's the recommended daily allotment. That's being very different than a clinical perspective. We have one person or one group in front of you and you want to have 100% uh, coverage. So this is what they had to say. This approach may be disconcerting to those with a clinical orientation who are familiar with the medical model in which the goal is to treat the patient in the most efficacious manner to enhance a positive outcome. So in fact, actually, um, this is going to be um, one thing that we have to say, ah, clinically, if I have a symptomatic person at high risk, we'll go for it. Okay. So that's where they said, you know, it's kind of 20 appears to have coverage for the population. And this is where we want to conclude now talking about challenges going ahead. Number one, dose versus serum level. Dose interventions um, are based upon a pharmaceutical approach, one size fits all. But in fact, serum level is really what matters for research. The best research in the future will be based upon serum levels. And that is, if we do a pharmaceutical intervention, the starting base for everyone is about zero for like a calcium channel blocker. So therefore we can dose. But the starting base for vitamin D status is going to be all over the map. So one size does not fit all. BMI is going to make a difference, certainly. And the CYP450 enzymes are going to make a difference, et cetera, et cetera. For vitamin D interventions, any interventional nutrition, we need to have a baseline serum level and a final serum level. Second, we need to recognize that there's a difference between a replenishment dose and a maintenance dose. And there'll be guidelines, I believe, coming out for that. Third, we want to take a look at whether um, ergocalciferol, vitamin D2, uh, which has a very short half-life, versus um, cholecalciferol, D3, which has a longer half-life, versus actually use of activated vitamin D, calcitriol. You have to take a look at multiple confounders, in particular race and heritage and age, et cetera. And then we have to take a look at um, issues such as vitamin D receptor, C4, uh, CYP450s, and the vitamin D binding protein. These are all things we need going forward. I'm a geeky internist. I like numbers. Measurement makes a difference for me. I cannot just give uh, one dose for everyone. It doesn't make any scientific sense. So take home points, I would say, Blood testing is, is very important from a clinical perspective. Um, goals at least level 32, I believe clinically, this is based on, on uh, multiple studies um, and the Endocrine Society guidelines in 2011. We can only achieve that by supplementing in places like Minnesota and places that are, are north of say uh, 25 degrees above the equator or below the equator. There are multiple medications which make a difference, including prednisone and valproic acid, and as well as St. John's wort and um, pro protease inhibitors and the like. And that there are many confounders, skin color, tobacco smoke exposure, use of sunscreen, working long hours indoors. Um, these all play a role. Now, I understand we've got some questions. Um, and uh, so let's um, open up for questions. I believe that participants, you can, um, can um, type in some questions and we'll uh, take them from there. I look forward to um, some, uh, some provocative, I hope I've been provocative and so look forward to uh, Q&A here. So let me go over to our Q&A. Okay, so
So, question um, coming um, from Jean. My parents, both in their 70s and living in Florida, take 50,000 international units of vitamin D2 daily. Okay, so this is ergocalciferol from mushroom source. Should we be taking this much? And should we be taking vitamin D3 instead? So, my response, clinical response, um, number one is I don't believe anyone needs 50,000 international units daily, um, whether it's D2 or D3. This is someone who I definitely would say we need a vitamin D uh, level on. And if, in fact, there are poor levels or low levels, we need to address issues of malabsorption. So is there unrecognized adverse food reactivity, like such as gluten? Is there unrecognized pancreatic exocrine insufficiency? Are there a variety of other issues? But no one needs to be taking that much every day. In fact, if I played hooky today and flew down to Florida um, to join your parents and uh, spent the day at the beach, I can make about 20,000 international units. Um, 50,000 is just beyond anything physiological, so it doesn't make sense. Question is about St. John's wort lowering or high raising level. It lowers the level. St. John's wort is an anti-vitamin D agent. NH, NIH studies currently underway that will settle some of these issues. No. Um, how about that for a provocative uh, response? The big vital study, um, we're taking 2,000 international units per day. Only a small fraction, if any, are actually having vitamin D levels measured in that. And it's going to be a five-year study. For that study to be successful, there cannot be any positive reports in the literature um, around vitamin D um, that would encourage people to go out and do vitamin D on their own and because it's um, uh, placebo-controlled or there's a very limited amount of vitamin D allowed um, in, um, in the um, arm uh, without the 2,000 international unit intervention. Additionally, there um, the key issues about we know about absorption and the like. Um, I think it's going to be very hard to, to get any practical clinical uh, data from the vital study, um, and that's just my opinion. Um, I hope to be proven wrong because it's $20 million. The NIH has just uh, committed $40 million to a good intervention trial around um, issues uh, of, of diabetes, uh, and there will be I believe, uh, 20 centers in the United States looking at that. I think it's going to be a good trial as long as they're getting vitamin D levels at the start and the finish. And it's kind of interventional nutrition is not a pharmaceutical trial. We have to we want to know what, what the baseline and what the ending levels are. Um, are there any forms of artificial light that will do the job as well as, as the sun in increasing vitamin D? Well, in fact, actually vitamin D tanning booths do exist. If people are getting ultraviolet B, and only ultraviolet B can make vitamin D, then people can make um, uh, vitamin D in a tanning booth. This can and be an issue. In fact, we kind of showed a tanning booth at the start uh, from Soviet Russia, where the kids uh, sitting, standing around in their underwear around the green light were getting ultra, ultraviolet B for making vitamin D. So for people with really poor absorption, a short bowel syndrome or other kind of uh, challenges. Um, my recommendation is uh, sometimes to use an ultraviolet B tanning booth. But I tell people, towel over the face and um, safe sunning or safe tanning, no burning. And, and this is only used in people who cannot absorb very well. Um, and usually I recommend about a third of the recommended time uh, for a tan. So what are the updated calcium recommendations um, for osteopenia and osteoporosis? Um, I actually refer you to the IOM report because I, this invites me to step out and, and make um, uh, share things from opinion and bias. World Health Organization does recommend 500 milligrams of calcium a day for vitamin D replete women. Um, there is a range of vitamin D levels that includes a high end of 50. Let me uh, let's take a look at this question here. Um, okay. Um, so this is uh, from Susie in Connecticut. There's a range of desired vitamin D levels include a high end of 50. Main websites talk about patients need to ramp up to 80. 
is a research of effects have a limit of 50. No, at this time, there's very little guidance around what is an optimal vitamin D level. So anyone who's making recommendation um, beyond the Endocrine Society uh, recommendations of greater than 30, um, uh, it's really uh, drawing more um, inference and that we don't have solid uh, research to support uh, levels greater than 80. A lot of people are looking at epidemiologic studies and saying, oh, well, if lifeguards run levels around 60, maybe that's where we should be. And so that's why there are, there are suggestions by the Endocrine Society that a level 40 to 60 nanograms per ml might be ideal, but we don't have definitive data to support that. Okay, um, so related to this is, I'm un um, Noel writes, I'm un still unclear if maintaining a level of, of 75 to 100 nanograms per ml, and that's roughly, um, um, roughly 30 uh, to 40, nan I'll say 75 to 100 nanograms per ml is ideal or is this the high end of the spectrum? That's on the high end of the spectrum. We do not have good data to, to suggest that. And so, uh, and so at best that is for you to work um, in partnership with your health professional on. Does prednisone affect vitamin D level? Yes. In fact, actually decadron even more so. Um, data just presented at the Society of Integrative Oncology last month from researchers in Vancouver, uh, the Prostate Health Center, demonstrated definitively that decadron has profoundly uh, altered vitamin D metabolism and results in significantly lower levels of serum vitamin D. Same thing, prednisone affects uh, vitamin D functioning at the, cortis, um, um, at the cellular level. Um, and so we have, for people on prednisone, we want to make sure that um, they're already at risk for bone loss, making sure they have good vitamin D levels. So is sun exposure more, than, uh, more sufficient than vitamin D supplementation in tropical areas? Yeah, so um, we can do just fine in tropical areas um, as long as we're outside in the sun, um, not working long hours indoors, safe sunning, no burning. Um, um, Okay, um, Miriam reports that I used to have moods ups and downs and began taking 4,000 daily. Since then, I've really felt improvement. What do you think about the role of vitamin D and poly, vitamin D polymorphisms in depression? Fascinating research out there around the role of vitamin D and mood. And I would urge um, everyone who is interested in this topic to just go to PubMed and put in vitamin D and depression. You'll be kind of stunned uh, what, we're, what is being reported. However, most of these reports are associations. There have not been intervention trials. All we have is anecdotes, uh, like your report, Miriam, about doing much better. And that includes like um, major depression, includes seasonal affective disorder, um, and the like. Um, vitamin D as a hormone appears to be as important as our other hormones, thyroid, estrogen, testosterone. If we're low on them, we have kind of systemic uh, effects. And so my point is, why, sh if someone is symptomatic, let's make sure that at least their vitamin D levels are, are good. Daily versus monthly dosing um, is an important topic. Uh, thank you, um, Yan Bin, for writing on this. Um, I recommend daily because monthly you're going to get, you've got pharmacokinetics and you've got too much variation. You cannot guarantee a good normal level throughout the month with a single dose because you activate your uh, CYP-P450s to, to actually break down the vitamin D very quickly. So a steady, gentle dose daily makes more sense. Um, so a year ago, there was a lot of energy behind promoting vitamin D as part of preventing breast cancer. Um, has anything changed uh, in this topic? Well, in fact, the Society for Integrative Oncology will be coming out a report on breast cancer recommendations um, uh, in the very near future. Um, again, PubMed has a huge literature on vitamin D and breast cancer risk. We do know that vitamin D is a hormone that does regulate cellular proliferation, differentiation, apoptosis, and plays a synergistic effect with gamma radiation and multiple chemotherapeutic agents, according to the literature has not been subjected to large randomized uh, prospective trials. So 
quote, evidence does not exist. But again, for anyone with a history of cancer, um, my point is, given that there's so much deficiency in this country, why not guarantee that there's a sufficiency um, during a major um, health challenge? Um, but we can only know that by actually getting measurements. And so um, I've been shocked by the number of patients I've seen with cancer diagnoses um, with high risk factors um, by malabsorptions, like pancreatic cancer patients, like who've never had a vitamin D level checked, even though gemcitabine and vitamin D have a nice synergistic effect. So we need to uh, uh, increase the awareness that actually this is a confounder for our clinical trials. I certainly hope that there can be no false negative clinical trials of a promising chemotherapeutic agent because the population had a low vitamin D level. Um, and we certainly saw that with interferon and hepatitis C is that the disproportionate effect of interferon, uh, ribavirin therapy or hepatitis C, was based on the fact that actually African Americans in that population had low vitamin D levels and the actual mechanism of action of the therapeutic intervention depended upon the vitamin D level. Same thing can occur in cancer, I believe, as well. More data needed. Do vitamin D levels affect sleep patterns? Uh, thank you, Carmen, for writing about this. I noticed that being after being vitamin D depleted after many years living in Norway, um, I took 5,000 international units a day and had very vivid dreams and slept very well. Actually, there have been a couple articles in the medical literature suggesting that vitamin D deficiency is a contributor to sleep disruption. We certainly know that vitamin D receptors throughout um, the brain, including areas related to mood and sleep, um, and so it makes sense that if one is depleted, and living in Norway is certainly a risk factor, uh, then, uh, then replenishment would have a, a difference. Um, this has not been subjected to randomized controlled trials. Um, so again, we need to have more measurements and more intervention trials in the literature to say with definitively. But this raises kind of a question for the larger group, though, and that is the question about, well, for something which is low cost and low toxicity, easily measured and monitored, why not? And here's, here's bias and opinion. My bias and opinion is that vitamin D represents the single most cost-effective medical intervention we have in um, North America today. Single most cost-effective medical intervention we have. Why aren't we putting that into play? Again, it's a value judgment. Um, but Kimberly writes, um, people who get little sunshine, such as those in the Northwest, Seattle, Portland, and the like, typically have winter depression, you know, seasonal affective issues. Does taking vitamin D supplements help to increase these bouts with depression? Multiple anecdotal reports say yes. This is a nice thing for N of 1 clinical trials with your health professional. Consider um, actually you know, getting a measurement, replenishing, normalizing, doesn't make a difference. Now, obviously, seasonal affective depression will also be affected by exercise and by circadian rhythm management. And so the use of phototherapy light boxes and melatonin may also be playing a significant role. But uh, vitamin D, I again, these false negative in, uh, trials, I would not want there to be a phototherapy light box trial for circadian rhythm management without a normal vitamin D level. It could be a confounder. You can have a false negative trial. Um, has there been an increase in osteomalacia as well as rickets? Um, thank you, uh, Gemma, for writing uh, this. In fact, actually, in the UK, you reported in the last 15 years, the incidence of rickets has gone up fourfold. As kids with severe enough rickets to be hospitalized, has gone up fourfold in the last 15 years in the UK. If we look about osteomalacia, think about the chronic pain populations in the United States. You know, the article that I published in, in um, the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in 2003 went on to become one of the most highly cited articles in the history of the journal, showing that people with chronic nonspecific musculoskeletal pain had extremely low vitamin D levels. Is that part of the clinical practice now uh, for anyone with chronic pain? Well, in fact, actually, a lot of nonspecific chronic musculoskeletal pain really is an osteomalacia syndrome. And so, again, before putting someone on oxycodone or doing 
a lot of intervention trials, which are expensive, or interventions uh, such as injections and the like, um, or certainly surgery, I would want to make sure that people are getting uh, at least normal vitamin D levels. In the 2003 report, I document five people with unmeasurable vitamin D levels, including one gentleman who went for multiple uh, back surgeries and angioplasties with no demonstrable disease, but they said, well, there's maybe a distal lesion in this or uh, coronary artery, and it keeps coming to the emergency room. Let's go in angioplasty. Uh, over $200,000 worth of interventions before he discovered he had no vitamin D. Huh. So I'm thinking that anyone with a chronic pain condition is not well explained, and before doing big expensive interventions, let's at least make sure they've got a good vitamin D level. Um, do you think some of the benefits of sun exposure are due to cholesterol sulfate synthesis rather than vitamin D? Well, thank you, Catherine, for writing about this. It's very interesting that our pre-vitamin D is 7-dehydrocholesterol. So the question is, why do cholesterol levels go down in the summer for populations and up in the winter? Does it have anything to do with vitamin D exposure? Interesting hypothesis. What does it mean to be on a statin? Does that block 7-dehydrocholesterol production and therefore reduce our capacity to make vitamin D from the sun? Interesting hypotheses, kind of strange new uh, science, but hold that question. We need data on this. These are great hypotheses that need to be tested. Um, we talk about connection between vitamin D and chronic pain and chronic low back pain. Um, in the medical literature, there are a lot of studies on vitamin D and chronic low back pain. One that is a practical clinical uh, consideration was published in Spine in 2002 or 2003, looking at 650 people coming to a surgical low back pain clinic in Saudi Arabia. They found <laughs> that these people all were profoundly vitamin D deficient. And after replenishing their vitamin D, uh, I, just a handful needed back surgery. Um, uh, Dr. Schaffenberg in Canada published on uh, six um, people with um, severe low back pain awaiting surgery in the Canadian National Health Service. Um, in fact, found that just replenishing their vitamin D, um, they did not need to go to surgery. So I think that these are very provocative things. There is a literature out there, but there are more small reports. They're not high quality evidence by evidence hierarchy. Um, so they still represent important hypotheses that way to be, uh, need to be tested. My question is, given the paucity of research funding, why not do a trial right here, right now on your own patient? Get a level, replenish it, remeasure, um, and assess um, pain status and functionality. Brief pain inventories, brief fatigue inventories, um, um, Promise uh, 10 or 29, there are lots of validated instruments that will help you document for your patient, did this make a difference? And I think that it would make sense for health systems to say, look, before you go for a $100,000 back surgery or spinal fusion or other things, let's at least make sure your vitamin D level is normal um, and see how well you do with that. Um, thank you for writing, Dinara, from um, Amasco, Dobayutua, um, Spasiba. There is an idea from some dietary specialists that um, uh, that there should be a better split um, in intake in two portions, say uh, twice per day. I don't have a good understanding of the data to support that because this is a fat soluble vitamin, and um, and so levels don't bounce a lot uh, around dosing. Um, and so, um, um, and so, it should not bounce significantly day to day, such as a, unlike other you know, vitamins, such as B vitamins, which are water soluble and will have significant variation. If there's additional data, and I'd love to see it, and um, I want to let people know that please contact me. Um, uh, here's my email address with questions: Gregory at Alina A L L I N A dot com or through my website, gregoryplotnikoff.com, or through the website, trustyourgut.com, uh, the book on gut distress. Um, 
Um, we'll continue taking questions for a couple minutes here. Um, what daily dose uh, do I recommend? I say dose does not matter. What counts is serum level. There is no one dose uh, that fits all. So I cannot make recommendations. I can tell you some people require 600 a day. Some people require 6,000 a day. I do know from randomized trials published by, uh, funded by the NIH and published by Hollis and Wagner had demonstrated that for breastfeeding mothers, you need at least 4,000 international units a day to get good breast milk uh, vitamin D levels uh, for your infant. So that would be one thing I can say for sure. There's data guiding that. In our clinical trials, I can say, um, done at um, Alina um, and in partnership with Mass General, uh, we can say that many people require significantly greater levels than 600 international units a day um, if they're, especially if they're vitamin D deficient to begin with. Um, but we can only know by measuring. I can't tell someone's cholesterol level by looking at them. I can't tell their thyroid functioning um, very much by looking at them. I can't tell their INR by looking at them. I can't tell their digoxin level, their valproic acid level. We get measurements. That is what guides us. It makes the invisible visible. And that's very important for, uh, for vitamin D status. Um, Carmen uh, writes about the uh, link between um, vitamin D, MS, and RA. Um, and uh, we certainly know um, that the further north you go, the higher the incidence of MS. And now even RA has recently been published as well. Um, and these are uh, local. Uh, the, the recent uh, uh, data on the RA, um, long-standing data from the U.S. Department of Defense and, and others around multiple sclerosis, people said, huh, maybe it's a vitamin D-dependent issue because vitamin D and latitude seem to be so closely correlated. And the definitive studies have not been published. However, um, anyone at risk for these, again, there are multiple other reasons, um, particularly just focusing just on bone health, where you'd want to normalize the vitamin D level. Um, but we do know that vitamin D is a potent regulator of the immune system. And that is, def that is well defined by the literature. And so we know that there, there is a biological plausibility that vitamin D then would have something to do with things related to the immune system. So biological plausibility hypotheses that vitamin D status can play a role in autoimmune disease can play a role in infectious disease. And if we look at data from the VA hospitals around total cost of care, around infectious disease issues, we know that vitamin D status plays a big role. If we look at data uh, presented at the um, uh, in, um, society, North American Society of Critical Care, uh, but I'm sorry, I'm not citing the right society here. We know that there have been abstracts presented about vitamin D status and morbidity and mortality in ICU units. Recent nice article in pediatric ICU units uh, in medical literature. Again, this is peer-reviewed medical literature. Associations, they're not intervention trials. Um, and so, um, but um, the value of an association is it may not be good evidence, but it certainly is a good hypothesis. And while we wait for randomized controlled trials and significant funding to generate those, we can always do this in our patients ourselves, N of 1 trials. Is my patient deficient? And if I replenish that, does it make a clinical difference? Um, so this is a question, important question from um, Millie. Um, what's the difference between a 125 dihydroxy vitamin D and a 25 hydroxy vitamin D serum levels? Is the measuring of the 125 useful? And um, and so the um, the question here is, 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are the best measures of vitamin D status. Period. We measure 125 only in very special situations, such as sarcoidosis, for example, um, uh, where you can actually have um, high 125 uh, levels being produced as a calcid trial. I imagine also if we're doing calcid trial interventions that we would also want to measure that as well to ensure that we're not producing, moving towards a hypercalcemic state. 
Um, so for vast, 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 vast majority of clinical situations, the 25 at this time is the best measure. Um, now, there's research going on taking a look at uh, additional uh, value for the 125. Um, nothing to report um, solidly on that at this time. Um, okay, vitamin D connection with neurologic psychologic disorders. Um, thank you, uh, Noel, for writing about this. Very interesting study um, uh, taking a look and just published on taking a look at vitamin D status and determinants of metabolic syndrome and other uh, factors um, associated with uh, morbidity and mortality in serious mentally ill patients. And in fact, it appears that vitamin D intervention does make a difference, at least in one trial. You know, my concern about um, mental health is that it's a measureless medicine. It's based on listening closely to people at a deep soul level and making decisions based on an intuitive sense. As an internist, I like quantifying. And so, in fact, there's great opportunities now for mental health and primary care um, and other physicians uh, to partner together um, and to bring um, the best of intuitive, qualitative, subjective um, understanding and the best of quantitative understanding. And because vitamin D is low cost, low toxicity, toxicity intervention, Gagan vitamin D level in, uh, it seems to be well supported um, in the medical literature as a reasonable um, clinical um, assessment to understand the status of the patient. Um, can vitamin D be achieved through diet alone? Robert, thank you for asking this question. There is like no vitamin D in the diet. Sorry. You know, it's kind of, you know, unless you're eating like an entire salmon a day or drinking a couple gallons of milk a day, you're not going to get a lot of vitamin D in the diet, particularly in northern climates. Um, yes, there's 10 international units of vitamin D in an egg. Well, if you're needing minimum, you know, are you going to do 60 eggs a day? I don't think so. So, um, so the um, USDA has reported that and at least in the past, that 28% of all skim milk samples that had vitamin D listed on the label had no vitamin D in the product itself. So you're not going to be guaranteed getting good vitamin D intake drinking a gallon or more of milk a day. And most, of, I don't, I can't say name a single adult who needs to be taking in significant amounts of cow's milk, fortified cow's milk. So for this reason, that's why I say. You know, safe sunning, no burning in the months where you can make vitamin D for free. Um, but if you work long hours indoors, like most um, uh, people watching this and listening to this now, you're going to need to supplement. And guidance for supplementation requires measurement. And that's the, um, um, but at least at 45 degrees north, we need to supplement at least in September, October, November, December, January, February, March, and April. It's just a few months where we can do it. But if you have a great July 4th picnic um, and get a good vitamin D dose from being outside, in general, that vitamin D will be gone by Labor Day. And if you have a great Labor Day picnic, um, get a good vitamin D dose, uh, that vitamin D generally will be gone by Halloween. So um, to you know, guarantee good vitamin D levels in Northern Hemisphere in January, February, uh, March, and April absolutely requires either someone to write your prescription for a week in South America or Hawaii or Florida um, on a beach or to supplement. And supplementation does not need to be expensive. Vitamin D is the same as vitamin D3. Um, and so uh, the, all the stores carry it uh, and now. I even saw it at a gas station the other day. So um, it's widely available. The more demand you create for vitamin D supplements, aren't you going to push the cost up? And well, actually, I um, have not seen that um, vitamin D should not be expensive. It's cheap, 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 cheap. I know at one big box retailer in, um, nationwide, um, 2,000 international units is about 1.8 cents per day. It's not going to go up significantly. That means, that means a good dose for entire pregnancy would be less than $5. Okay, um, 
D2 versus D3, and D2 um, comes from mushrooms. D3 comes from sheep lanolin. If anyone has concerns about animal products, um, even though it's outside the animal, it comes with, from the shearing of the wool, um, then use of D2 makes sense. D2 is not, dose for dose is not the same as D3. D2 has a much shorter half-life, and so it's not going to hang around nearly as much as D3. But for anyone worried about, you know, kind of pushing anyone to toxicity, as many of us were 10, 15 years ago, um, that's why D2 was so popular. Now we know that D3 is not, it's not so much of an issue. We're not seeing toxicity. Should um, children's vitamin D levels be different from adults? Well, actually, um, thank you, Susie, for asking about this. Actually, um, it really is, uh, levels um, appear to be the same for everyone and, uh, in terms of requirements. Has not been well studied in, in children. Uh, I think we're going to see more data on that in the future. But in the breastfeeding trials, we were looking at achieving um, the same vitamin D levels uh, as we would for um, older children, adolescents, and adults. Okay, um, is there a link between low vitamin D and osteoporosis? Yep, absolutely. Uh, Gemma, thank you for writing, but F, absolutely, no, no question. Um, people who demonstrate low vitamin D level, do those people also commonly present with problems, um, such as anemia or celiac disease? Yes, yes. So part of your differential diagnosis around malabsorption issues or refractory anemia, and there's a nice article on, refract on anemia in children just published uh, uh, very recently, um, um, have to consider vitamin D status and the differential, working up the differential diagnosis. Certainly celiac is a malabsorption issue. You're going to have fat malabsorption consequences um, with that. And it also appears to extend to non-celiac gluten sensitivity issues, and we can have fat malabsorption issues. And so all fat nutrients need to be considered uh, for that. Vitamin D and psoriasis, Yanbin, thank you for writing about this. Michael Hollick, um, you know, professor of medicine and dermatology at Boston University, actually did a lot of solid research on this, and topical vitamin D is now a commercial product uh, for, for treatment of psoriasis. Psoriasis being an, uh, an issue of Cellular proliferation and differentiation and apoptosis uh, means that vitamin D does regulate those key genes. And we know that, uh, vitamin, that uh, vitamin D interventions and topical interventions in psoriasis have been shown to make a difference. Um, so a person writes about the possibility of inheritance with poor vitamin D levels. If one patient presents with low vitamin D, should the rest of the family be tested? A very practical uh, question. It all depends um, on the clinical situation. The nuances are uh, BMI and dose and activity levels and sun exposure, and all these things play a role in that. However, I can speak about my own family. It's kind of like we tend to require significantly higher levels um, than, than others, and that's related to ethnicity and uh, and and genes. People who come from the Indian subcontinent, um, um, the India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the like, genetically have very fast vitamin D breakdown enzymes. And so therefore it becomes a big issue moving from Delhi to London or Minneapolis or Toronto, um, significant issues. That may also be true for people from West Africa, East Africa, and the like. Um, how soon should we start supplementation for babies? Prenatally. It's kind of mother vitamin D status. If you type in maternal vitamin D status and, um, um, and pregnancy, you'll find a very interesting literature on this. If we look at um, peer-reviewed articles in the leading pediatric literature, including pediatrics published by American Academy of Pediatrics, Vitamin D status does appear to play a role in all kinds of neurocognitive um, issues. So, prenatally, we want to make sure moms have a normal vitamin D level throughout pregnancy, and we want to make sure that if the child is breastfeeding, that there's enough vitamin D in the breast milk, 
And that means that mothers should be taking 4,000 international units a day based on randomized controlled trials. And if a child is bottle feeding, um, we'll make, we want to calculate total vitamin D intake by the volume of, of um, bottle feeding. D drops uh, are one product. There are liquid vitamin D products available on the market. Um, and so that would be um, something to consider, easily administered. Um, do you get a good amount of vitamin D from mushrooms? Uh, you can if they're sun exposed. They have to be sun exposed. They have to have ultraviolet B uh, exposure. What is the dose? It depends upon the thickness of the skin. So I published data with Paul Stamets where we looked at shiitake, maitake, and reishi mushrooms exposed to the sun and demonstrate profound increases uh, in vitamin D content. Is this, though, a defined dose? No, it isn't. And so we have to be uh, cautious about um, could we get too much? Well, I guess it depends on how much um, you find in mushrooms. Of a historical note, about one-third of all traditional East Asian herbal medicine formulas use a mushroom, on which in Japanese is pronounced bukryo, um, in uh, Chinese zhu ling. Um, this is poria cocos wolf. It is actually dug up out of the ground in blocks, chopped up into little pieces, and dried in the sun. Large surface area, sun exposure. So um, by historical reference, we can say that medicinal mushrooms found in traditional East Asian medicines um, actually could have a huge amount of vitamin D, and that may have been part of their therapeutic effectiveness. Contemporary traditional Chinese medicine and Japanese medicine, uh, Korean medicine formulas available commercially are all dried in ovens and therefore have no vitamin D in them. And so therefore, when people uh, pursuing these uh, healing traditional approaches um, may also want to get vitamin D levels measured and supplemented if appropriate. Um, Okay, I'm going through, um, um, let's take a look at um, additional questions here. Okay, another question, is there any work um, done on balance between fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K? The reason I ask, I came across some blog posts that some medical professional post said, only one fat-soluble vitamin should not be supplemented because it will pull out other fat-soluble fat -soluble stored vitamins, causing deficiency of those. So if we're supplementing with vitamin D, will it cause deficiency of A, E, or K? Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting question. I cannot answer that. I'm sorry. Um, if anyone has an has any data to guide this answer, please let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, understand uh, that. And, but it is related to a, a, a question Miriam has about, is a normal vitamin D level, uh, does that mean a normal level in other tissues? And we believe that the distribution is equal throughout the body. What is not equal is local activation. And that is the one alpha uh, uh, the 125 alpha hydroxylase um, for activating, uh, producing calcitriol, um, is actually varies. Um, um, and so that's why we talk about paracrine and autocrine in addition to um, endocrine functioning of vitamin D, is that you can have local environments uh, that could be, so it could be uh, locally regulated uh, responses. And so therefore, we want, I believe in making sure that upstream levels are normal and giving the body, allowing the body the wisdom to do what it needs to do with it. And um, because we don't have a, a very deep understanding of local regulation and its relationship to serum level, at least at a clinical level, on a basic science level, we're learning a lot. But we don't know what that means 
in any given human being at this time. And so um, I think as we wrap up here, uh, we've gone um, over. I appreciate um, your paying attention here, but um, uh, please feel free to contact me, um, gregoryplotnikoff.com or gregory.plotnikoff at alina.com, uh, A-L-L-I-N-A. Um, happy to be help. My goal in life is to be helpful. I try to speak uh, uh, from data, and I try to be aware of when I'm speaking from opinion and bias, and I try to, I'll try to identify what I'm doing from either. Uh, I hope this has been um, provocative and interesting and appreciate uh, your time and attention. Thank you all very much.